Good evening, everyone. Welcome to Continuing Conversations with, I just found out, Mr. TJ. I think that's really cool. And before we begin our conversation this evening, we're going to do our land acknowledgement and our mission statement from Not in Our Town. The land on which we are living is, the, is part of the ancient homeland and traditional territory of the Lene Lenape people. We pay respect to the Lene Lenape people past, present, and future and their continuing presence in their homeland and in the diaspora. We also acknowledge the millions of enslaved Africans and their descendants on whose backs the wealth of this nation was created. Not in Our Town Princeton is a multiracial, multi-faith group of individuals who stand together for racial justice and inclusive communities. Our focus is to promote the equitable treatment of all and to uncover and confront white supremacy, the system that facilitates the preference, privilege, and power of white people at the expense of non-white people and pits racial and ethnic groups against each other by upholding hierarchies based on proximity to whiteness. Our goal is to identify and expose the political, economical, and cultural systems which have enabled white supremacy to flourish and to create new structures and policies which will ensure equity and inclusion for all. In our commitment to uncovering the blight of white supremacy on our humanity, we take responsibility to address it in all its to address it and to eliminate it in all its forms through intentional actions, starting with ourselves and our community. Uh, good evening again, everyone. And at this time, I will turn the program over to Dr. Joy, who will now introduce our speaker. Thank you, Dr. BJ. Good evening. Thank you, Auntie Joyce. Good evening, everyone from Not In Our Town and our other partners like the Princeton Public Library. My name is Joy Barnes Johnson, and it is my delight to represent the Paul Robeson House of Princeton. Thank you. In introducing Thomas Lee Johnson, I would like to express our gratitude and invite you to be in conversation with us this evening. Thomas Lee Johnson is an inventor entrepreneur, filmmaker, and artist who is an award-winning screenwriter, film producer, CEO, and founder of AgileImmersive.com, a lecturer at Goethe uh, Graduate School of Pharma Business in Frankfurt, Germany, and executive coach to the Forbes Global 2000. He is a 1995 graduate of the United States Air Force Academy, and a 1998 CIA Graduate Fellow in Space Commercialization. Amanda and TJ have four boys, Ty, Ezra, Elijah, and Ephraim, and they enjoy motorsports. Won't you welcome TJ Johnson. TJ, thank you for joining us this evening. Hey, it's good to be with you. Thank you so much. Uh, I am I am delighted to be with you. And may I say, I commend you for having a spirit of community that lies down on marker and says, not in our town. That takes intention, that takes action. And that means that you are serious about what you say. And so I respect you for that. I'm going to have a conversation with us today. Uh, we're going to talk about the topic uh, of the friendship of Dr. Albert Einstein and Paul Robeson. I'm going to share my screen. Uh, I have a, a couple of, uh, uh, I have a, a little bit of a musical delight uh, to share as well. Uh, and uh, I, want, I want you just to, to in, intake the, the conversation, uh, the history that we're going to talk about, uh, and the food for thought. Uh, that we're going to, to sprinkle in. So I'm going to share my screen. T 
Tonight, we're going to talk about shattering the illusion of otherness, the Imago Dei that Paul Robeson and Dr. Albert Einstein realized a century ago. If you'd like to learn more about Albert and Paul, the movie, uh, and me as a filmmaker, please follow us on Instagram at Albert Paul Film. You can see that there uh, on the bottom right. I, I would like to say um, our heart aches for members of the Covenant School family in Nashville, Tennessee. Uh, one of the members of the Princeton Theological Seminary's emeritus community actually lives there in Nashville. And I spoke with him on Friday uh, this past week. He actually lives just a few miles away uh, from the Green Hills neighborhood. Uh, and so that tragedy touches closely. And, you know, that was, that tragedy was just one week ago. And there's something about that shattering, that tragedy, and tragedies, unfortunately, like that, um, that just, just removes the illusion of otherness quickly. And we realize that uh, we are suffering together. And we have a shared grief. And that also reminds us that we have a shared fate. Now, shared fate can lead us to some dim, dimly lit places where despair and hopelessness can grab us, or we can stay in the light of shared hope with shared action. And just by the nature of your creed, you in this group are have a bias toward action. So we're going to stay in the light tonight. Um, and we're going to use uh, Paul Robeson and, and Dr. Albert Einstein as a model for us uh, in this conversation. There are illusions that these two men shattered over 100 years ago. Our conversation is going to start in 1915. Uh, then we're going to go to 1924. Uh, and then we're going to go to 1935. And we're going to take snippets anecdotes from those uh, almost like time capsules and see how these men shattered the illusion of both fear, rejection, and otherness with the choices that they made and the courageous actions that they exhibited. Paul Robeson is known for creating harmony, uh, harmony with uh, folk songs and songs uh, that represent uh, African-American peoples, uh, but also other uh, peoples from around the world, peoples that have endured suffering and hardship. There's something about the harmony that he sings that really uh, inspires us. We wanna internalize, we wanna match, mirror, and sing that same harmony with our souls. In 2020, a Slovenian coloratura uh, soprano named Ernestira, Ernestina Yost performed a duet with a projection of Paul Robeson's voice and his image in a concert hall. And they were singing one of Paul Robeson's favorite Czech composers, Antonin Dvorak's Songs My Mother Taught Me. It's actually based on an ancient gypsy song and in Czech, it's Gis min stara matka vzjat vzjat učala, pod vina kast kast zvetala, a ta takam plasem snid lis musem, which translates songs my mother taught me. Now I teach my children each melodious measure, off the tears flow from my brown skin. It's amazing how a 19th century composer inspired our 20th century giant, Paul Robeson. This has been brought to even greater uh, applause because uh, it's actually being shared these days uh, in concert halls. I'm gonna share this very brief snippet with you now.
So that's just a snippet of the concert that was just done just a couple of years ago in Slovenia. Paul Robeson, still inspiring audiences to this very day, our giant, uh, Paul Robeson. We just were so inspired by him uh, from generation to generation. And that great harmony is what we're going to discuss more tonight. The illusions that Paul Robeson and, and Albert Einstein were able to shatter are rejection, fear, and otherness. Rejection, as you know, uh, makes us feel like we don't belong. Fear makes us feel afraid. And sometimes we can become paralyzed by fear. Otherness makes us feel strange, removed. And for realization, <laughs> this is a funny little picture of a, a child realizing that his mom doesn't understand his cry for peanut butter cookies, actually get some peanut butter cookies, he's given milk instead. Um, sometimes what we express doesn't get us what we want. So there's, there's something about shattering the illusion and realizing that it can be shattered uh, that we're going to explore tonight. When we say Imago Dei, we mean the likeness and co-creation and rational capacity of our creator. Shattering means to destroy into fragments. The illusion is misleading impressions of reality and otherness is being perceived as different or strange. The first illusion of rejection, we're gonna explore an excerpt from the lives of uh, Paul Robeson when he was, uh, he, and he actually entered into uh, Rutgers University in 1915. He was the third African-American accepted into Rutgers and he tried out for the football team. Now, I'm sure that many, many folks know the, the, the story. The team, when, while he was doing tryouts with the team, he was literally tackled so hard, so repeatedly, that he had bones in his hands shattered. He had bruised ribs and other, and, and a concussion. And he had just other injuries to the point to where he actually found himself limping off the field. When Paul Robeson went to William Drew Robeson pop and said, and showed him his injuries and showed him what it, what it, what it cost him to even try to get into the, the, the football team, obviously the team rejected him violently. Uh, Pop showed him uh, his hands. Now, William G. Robeson, as you know, at, at the age of 15, Pop had escaped from, uh, from slavery uh, in, uh, from Winston County, uh, North Carolina, and had worked as a laborer burying bodies during the Civil War. And he worked as an ash man, which means he helped dispose of ashes and garbage. So Pop had some scars on his hands and he showed uh, Roby uh, the cost of what it meant for him to be free and inspired him to go back and not take no for an answer. And so Paul Robeson went back to Rutgers, went back to the football tryouts and the, the first person who tried to hit him hard, he hit him back and actually lifted him up over his head and was about to body slam him on the football field when the coach blew the whistle. Roby, Roby, stop. You made the team. <laughs> Paul Robinson shattered the illusion of rejection with action and courage. And his football uh, heroics uh, are known by all. He made all state uh, national team. He was considered the best defensive end in, in, in Rutgers history. Uh, you know, he shattered the illusion. I think you would agree. Now, Albert Einstein in 1915 was uh, courageous as a scientist. He was actually, Albert Einstein was actually rejected from Zurich Polytechnic 
on his first entrance exam. He's rejected by very well-respected physicist, Lamore, Veen, Kaufman, and their theories on electromagnetism that left no room for special relativity or general rel relativity, which are papers that Albert Einstein had written and, and, and published in 1905. Albert was so out of sync with established academia in 1915, he could barely find a job. He couldn't get a job in academics, so he had to settle for a clerkship at the Swiss Patent Office. Though rejected by his peers, rejected by academia, he persisted. His theory of general relativity was soon to be released in late 1915, early 1916. He explained gravitational wave properties in space-time, which upended theories of both ether and electromagnetics. His ideas were so rejected as totally impractical and absurd and befogged speculation that there were certain uh, British scientists uh, and uh, other uh, scientists across the continent of Europe that would not receive, would not even take Dr. Einstein into audience. They would not let him uh, speak before them or lecture. But he persisted despite rabid opposition. He persisted and actually started to win over his fellow Austrian and Prussian scientists. Now, there's a certain realization that both Dr. Einstein and Paul Robeson carried with them. There was a, a courage, a, a, a willingness to, to break convention that they carried with them their entire lives. They were willing to, in Paul Robeson's case, not be a Presbyterian minister like his father. And for Albert Einstein, not be a, uh, a, a street lamp creator and salesman in Munich. Their willingness to shatter illusions and shatter rejection meant sometimes they had to walk alone. So shattering the illusion of rejection, rejection really requires self-acceptance. The next illusion we're gonna talk about is the illusion of fear. And fear is a powerful force in our human life. So to shatter it takes tremendous energy, effort, focus, and belief. In 1924, Eugene O'Neill wrote, All God's Chillins Got Wings. And he actually hired a young Paul Robeson to play the lead character alongside a white actress named Mary Blair at Princeton Playhouse, at Provostown Playhouse and Greenwich Village Theater in New York. Paul, at this time in 1924, had already graduated from, the, from Columbia's Law School and had already passed the New York Bar and was a practicing lawyer. So in a way, one of the first fears that Paul broke through was career was simply you know, breaking the, 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 a, a career stereotype. The, why would a lawyer appear on stage, especially at a small uh, theater like the Provincetown Playhouse, putting at risk his legal career and all the sacrifice that he had done just to graduate from Columbia Law School? Newspapers, both specifically the New York American and the Morning Telegraph, published incendiary articles to create a violent riot against Paul, Mary, and Provostown Playhouse. The papers felt it was scandalous and irresponsible of Eugene O'Neill and the producers at Provostown Playhouse to allow an African-American to appear on stage and get this, allow a white woman to touch and kiss his hand. That was a controversy. 1924, a mob was, was trying to get riled up and burn down the Provincetown Theater because 
a white woman kissed a black man's hand on stage. Well, Paul Robeson wasn't going to budge and neither did Eugene O'Neill. Paul said, we're going to produce this play. We're going to put this play on at Provincetown and we're not going to let bigots and the violent mobs they're trying to, to, to gin up stop us from showing this play. So his inspiration, his courage inspired Provincetown's producer's courage and the play went up May 15th, 1924. Paul had found a peace pass understanding in order to play this character on stage, knowing that there is a riot being attempted to be spun up against him. But nevertheless, he did it. That's courage. And courage is how the illusion of fear is broken. Dr. Einstein also had to overcome the illusion of fear. In 1924, Dr. Albert Einstein was then a Nobel laureate. General relativity was validated by the Lorenz experiment, yet his one of one intellectual prowess remained hungry for more discovery despite bigoted reactions to his ascendant fame. General relativity was actually validated by uh, the observation of a solar eclipse by other scientists. So he, you know, Dr. Einstein was validated. Often academics and those who know excellence and success, once you, <laughs> once you finally climb that mountain, typically you stay there. You don't risk all the prestige you just earned to yet push further and potentially be proven wrong. But Dr. Einstein was not satisfied with his past accomplishments. He knew he was upending Galileo, Newton, Max Planck, Wilhelm Wien et al. He imagined gravity, space time, and the speed of light and its constant before humankind ever had the tools to actually measure the speed of light. Dr. Einstein wanted to go further. He wanted to go further. He felt that there was a universal theory that could explain all of these other subordinate forces and actions of gravity, space, time, and light. String theory. He pursued it publicly and famously, along with Jacob Gromer, uh, a mathematics uh, assistant for Dr. Einstein and his unified field theory, uh, they famously failed. The, the, the math wasn't adding up. The unified field, field theory was not validated. And Dr. Einstein had to admit he, he wasn't quite getting where he wanted to go with unified field theory. But the illusion of fear, fear of failure was still shattered because Dr. Einstein persisted in his attempts to build and create and mathematically prove unified field theory. Paul had realized that fear, violence, and mob attack threats thrive in anonymity and darkness. When he insisted, when Paul insisted on May 15th, 1924, the show must go on, he knew that under those stage lights where everyone could see anyone who was, you know, starting, uh, you know, any type of violence or upheaval, the, the anonymous could not hide. And he, he gambled that the people who were trying to be incendiary, if they were brought out to light, they couldn't hide behind the ink of the newspapers, they wouldn't be violent so that the show would go on. And Paul ended up being correct. May 15th, 1924, the show went on. The illusion of fear was shattered at Provincetown Playhouse. Albert had realized that the subtle and intangible, uh, inexplicable laws that bound the universe together could not be discovered 
with prejudiced curiosity. He knew there must be unprejudiced curiosity and rigorous examination of theoretical possibilities in unified field theory. He refused to kowtow, to bend, to relent to known forces of his era. Now, that fear of failure was shattered by his courage to publicly will be willing to fail. And unified field theory was not proven in 1924, but he persisted nevertheless, and his relentless pursuit is legendary. The next fear, the fear of otherness, is the fear of being estranged, of being different. In 1935, Paul was at the peak of his fame. He had filled the most prestigious concert halls on earth, Carnegie Hall, Royal Albert Hall in London, the Paris Opera House, and hundreds of others. Paul was a polymath, a polyglot who spoke 20 languages. He had a Michael Jackson-like fame in terms of the world knowing his name an NFL all-star athletic talent, a scholar enrolled at the School of African and Oriental Studies, and an activist for Welsh, Irish, Russians, and African Americans. Paul embraced all ethnicities, all the downtrodden from every continent on earth that he could touch. In Paul Robeson's mind, there was no otherness. He saw us as a community of people. In 1935, Albert was one of the most photographed people on earth. He was a confirmed genius, a Nobel laureate, a guest of presidents, prime ministers, kings, and the ruling global aristocracy. Albert recognized Jewish minority treatment and how it mirrored African-American treatment. And we know this because he said so in correspondence with W.E.B. Du Bois that we can read in 1933. Albert Einstein, now I'm about to, now I know, listen, I know there's a bunch of Paul Robeson scholars on this call. I might, I might, I might surprise you. There's, here's a Western Union, Union telegram. You, Al, you Paul Robeson scholars, you Albert Einstein scholars, did you know Paul, uh, Albert Einstein sent this telegram from Berlin to Montgomery, Alabama on the 4th of July in 1931? He says, Governor Miller, in the name of humanity and justice, we beg you to reserve the execution of the eight Negroes of Scottsboro cast for death. Committee for Deliverance of the Victims of Scottsboro, Professor Albert Einstein, Thomas Mann, et al. Professor Albert Einstein was an anti-racist in 1931, while he was a professor in Berlin, before he had even became an American citizen in 1933. Albert Einstein embraced all as members of the human community. And he also had shattered the illusion of otherness long before he met his friend, his friend to be Paul Robeson. We know by eyewitness account on October 31st, 1935, at the, at the performance of Paul Robeson at McCarter Theater, Albert Einstein waited till the crowd fizzled out and actually went and knocked on Paul Robeson's dressing room door and introduced himself. And of course, Paul Robeson said, doctor, the world knows who you are. And that is the friendship the beginning of the friendship 
of Albert Einstein and Paul Robeson. There's something about the realizations that these two gentlemen had a hundred years ago that allowed them to reject fear and, and shatter fear, shatter rejection, shatter otherness. They knew that unity moves mountains. That's why Dr. Albert Einstein even sent this Western Union telegram to Governor Miller with a committee of other professors. Now, what's really neat is when Albert and Paul became good friends, they took action against the Franco fascists in, uh, in Spain. And there were other like-minded uh, Spaniards who came alongside them like Pablo Neruda, uh, Garcia Lorca, uh, Pablo Picasso, and many, many others. Also, uh, did you know fact, the war correspondent who took pictures of the events in early fascist Spain for the newspapers here in America was a young photographer named Ernest Hemingway who was taking photographs while he was documenting and taking notes uh, for one of his future books, For Whom the Bell Tolls. Okay. Now, Dr. Albert Einstein and Paul Robeson realized that Jewish orphans were being victimized and, and neglected. Uh, Anti-fascists and partisans in Spain were being victimized. They band together with other like-minded individuals to take action to protect them to raise money for them uh, and for them to be able to immigrate. They also knew that they were th that a multi-ethnic, multi-faith coalition changes the atmosphere. Bigotry, violence, and intolerance thrives in the illusion. When the illusion melts away and fades away, there, there, there's, a sh there's a shared sense of hope and belonging that all human beings experience. So in the illusion of otherness, the Imago Day was realized by both Paul Robeson and Albert Einstein. Now we know Paul Robeson was raised by his Presbyterian pastor father, William Drew Robeson. And we know Paul strayed from the faith of his youth. And we know Albert Einstein was raised Jewish. We also know that he strayed from the faith of his youth. However, there are elements that stayed with them from their faith for their lifetime. And we know that because we read the letters that they write. We actually have journal entries that they've written. When it comes to the Imago Dei, the Imago Dei uh, comes from what, uh, the Presbyterian pastor, William Drew Robeson, would have taught from Genesis 131, where he said, God saw, God saw all that he had made, and behold, it was very good. The Hebrew of very good is tav me'od, which means greater harmony with Elohim. There's a spectrum of tav me'od. There's a spectrum of harmony, good to very good. And Albert, when, when asked about his faith, in a letter, Albert said, I believe in Baruch Spinoza's God. Baruch Spinoza was a Dutch Jewish philosopher. And he wrote about the, the, the theories of theism. And, Paul, and Albert Einstein wrote, I believe in Spinoza's God who reveals himself in the orderly harmony of what exists. When Paul Robeson in 1924 was looking for the courage to actually perform at the Provincetown Playhouse, he referenced one of William Drew Robeson's sermons on Mark 439, where Christ rebukes the wind and says to the wind, peace be still. And there was a great calm. Paul Robeson reflected on 
what it meant to be godlike. And we know he wrote in his journal, November 12th, 1929, anyone is born with a chance to be godlike, just as any painting has a chance to be great when artist begins. So give all a chance, but most fall by the wayside. We know that Albert wrote to W.E.B. Du Bois on the 29th of October, 1931. The evil of race prejudice can be met through closer union and conscious educational enlightenment among the minority. And so emancipation of the soul can be obtained. These men were grounded in the Imago Dei, the Tov Me Ode, the very great, the very good harmony with their creator and with their fellow man. That is how they shattered the illusion of otherness. There's something about great harmony, which <laughs> brings us all together <laughs> and shatters the illusion that we were apart in the first place. My friends, there's something about a harmony. And in this journey of a tov me'od, a great harmony, I hope that we are all, that we are all born into. I hope that we take the invitation to internalize, match, mirror, and sing with our souls. And may it be a very good harmony. It is our choice. Thank you. Uh, I believe Connie Ellen Govan is going, Dr. Connie Ellen Govan is going to uh, prepare us for the breakout rooms. Thank you so much, Mr. Johnson. Happy to share. Thank you so much. That was absolutely delightful. And of course, I am humbled to have learned lots of things uh, about. Um, the parallel lives and agency of Paul Robeson and Albert Einstein. That was a beautiful presentation. So thank you very much for that. Connie, are you? I, I wasn't sure if anyone from Paul Robeson uh, Center was going to speak. Is that correct, Dr. Biche? Is anyone else going to speak? Or? I think uh, Denise had prepared a few comments. And okay. if not, um, if not, then we can move forward. We would love to be able to share some of the amazing things that we have happening over the next two weeks. So let me see. Is Denise uh, going to say a few words. Denise, you ready? Yep. I'm great. I'm Should I start speaking? I see I Please. see my just one of the squares. First of all, uh, we're so happy that we were invited by um, Princeton Not in Our Town to celebrate Paul Robeson's 125th birthday with you on your first Monday in April. Uh, a year ago we were thinking about what, what are the kinds of things we like to bring together. Uh, to, to make sure that our larger community understands what an outstanding Renaissance man Paul Robeson was and all the major contributions he had, but also the struggles that he um, suffered with with the American government. So we have uh, arrayed, and thank goodness, we have um, collaborated with many, many people, um, including um, our association now with the Paul Robeson House and Museum in Philadelphia. Together, we won a $1 million uh, Mellon grant over two years, much of which is going to go into the continued restoration of our house. But it's also going to help us um, have staff, our first executive director and first paid staff. And we're going to do um, all kinds of programming, of which Dr. Dr. Joy has been such a great leader in. Um, just last night, we were able to go out with our donors and friends, 
spent an evening in New York City. I must admit, I, I have not been on subway in years. I was not been on music transit. So everything is so different now. But we actually heard a very wonderful baritone, Mark Doss. Um, after that, he reached out to us, his agency. He'd like to be a member of, he wants to be one of the people interviewed on Dr. Barnes's wonderful podcast series, which has featured our Robeson scholars who are high school students. But this year we have uh, three new Robeson fellows who are adults. And we like our, our, our Robeson scholars and fellows to help us get the word out. The tagline that our board and our advisory committee and um, our other friends within the Robeson community have adopted is just let's make Robeson a household name. You know, why shouldn't everybody know Paul Robeson? Certainly, we began with why doesn't every school child in Princeton know um, Robeson? So after today, we have uh, we're gonna, we have a wonderful video that's going to be uh, launched. Um, Dr. Joy has done a lot of research and thinking, as have many people, about the power and importance of freedom, freedom gardens, the relationship between Paul Robeson and the Russian people. Uh, the Robeson tomato, I think she'll say more about it at the end of our discussion. Uh, there are people who come upon us and say, well, how can I get my Robeson tomato seeds? Uh, Lance Lieberman said, well, how am I going to get my seeds at our last advisory committee? Because that's sort of gone on fire. As, as far as Philadelphia, people are, are now talking about, you know, how can they start and get their Robeson uh, tomatoes? On the train ride back, I was with um, Larry Alves from Nassau. He has already started his seeds. He's got 30 plants would like to share. So that's just the beginning of getting everybody talking about Paul Robeson and what a wonderful person he was. And um, what a great example, as TJ mentioned, what a great example to uh, aspire to in terms of how you live your life with integrity, with intention. And um, yes, William Drew Robeson did say, son, get back in there. His, his brothers, his siblings, get back in there because you have these talents, you have this, this light, L-I-G-H-T. On Saturday, oh boy, we normally do a wreath laying at the um, bust of Paul Robeson that's right uh, the square at, our, at the Arts, Arts Council, but we're doing, and the mayor does proclaim Paul Robeson Day. Philadelphia is working on having there be a Paul Robeson Day April 9th in Philadelphia, and there are 11 other Robeson organizations that are part of our Robeson Alliance. They're all working on that. Uh, we already have a, a street that's named after Paul Robeson, and we learned on Saturday that Philadelphia is going to have at 50th and Walnut, that's gonna be a Paul Robeson um, hallway or plaza or piece. Um, and our, our dream is to have there be a national Paul Robeson day. So we're reaching out to the, the Black Caucus, uh, talking to uh, our senators, our, our representatives, see what is, what is it gonna to take to make Paul Robeson um, a national name as well. So on the 8th, we have um, the Robeson Fellows are going to be introduced. We've learned this week, we've commissioned a, uh, a poem, the, uh, the most well-known and only Robeson poem that people uh, cite is the one that Gwendol Gwendolyn Brooks wrote many, many years ago. Um, but we have identified a poet here in Princeton who's a um, member of the Princeton faculty, and she has been commissioned to write a brand new Robeson poem, which will be unveiled, we believe, on April 8th, busy day. And there'll be a walking tour um, of the major, I think there are eight different spots that are very important to the Robeson story and narrative that Shirley Satisfield has already identified. And we, as members of the board and advisory committee, we will be at those stations and we'll have scripts that Shirley prepares to, uh, to tell people all about what, what Green Street meant, what the Robeson House's birthplace meant, what the what with this Green Street and sanctuary and the stained glass windows meant, what the cemetery plot means. Um, so that will enrich all of us. And uh, we are warned that 48 people are coming in a bus from Philadelphia. This is the first time many of them will have had a chance to be downtown Princeton, even though they're tearing up downtown Princeton, and see the progress that's being made on the house. Our architect, Kevin Wilkes, is going to be there to talk about the beginnings, the middle, the end of the project, and how, how that's going to unfold. But uh, there's a lot of love there, a lot of, a lot of things that need to be shared about the careful, thoughtful uh, restoration that's been going on with the house. Um, and, and there's, there's going to be food, there's going to be a lunch, then we get to go over to the library um, after all of the walking and talking and eating, 
um, at any time, I think starting April 5th, and, and Kim can correct me, you could go to the second floor conference room in the Princeton room. I'm thinking we used to have our Black Voices book group meeting there in person. But in that room with that fabulous bust of Robeson is there's an ex exhibition of uh, images and, and um, memorabilia that just talk about and describe Paul Robeson. Um, and so people can spend time there. And then they'll, in the afternoon, there is a panel discussion led by Dr. Jessica Williams. Um, and, and she's also gonna be in conversation with a professor from the Pace Center and also from Rutgers whose names escape me. Uh, but again, they're gonna keep probing otherness, belonging. Um, how does Paul Robeson's life fit into what's going on today? As TJ mentioned, there's, there's so much going on today that he previewed and envisioned that we're still struggling and working on. So that's Saturday. Uh, the Philadelphia people say goodbye to us uh, on, at four o'clock, six o'clock in the morning, no, 6.30 in the morning. We wake up and we go to the Princeton Cemetery owned by Nassau Church. Easter sunrise service, all are welcome, all are welcome. Um, Reverend Dave Davis will be providing the worship service. Uh, and then we're going to ask people to come by to Witherspoon Street Presbyterian Church, second floor, Fellowship Hall, and there'll be a Robeson breakfast, Robeson breakfast. And uh, that's from 7.30 till about nine. And then people are gonna go on and have their regular observances um, in Princeton uh, and in Trenton in terms of their Easter service. Our Philadelphia friends are gonna continue on to New York and spend um, Easter Sunday at Mother Emanuel's, Amy Zion's church where his, um, his brother was the pastor for many years. And that very same baritone who we met last night, Mark Doss, He's going to be singing at that Easter worship service, which is amazing. And then there's going to be a, um, an invited brunch at Columbia Law School where uh, one of our friends, TJ Riley, where, where um, Riley Jones went. So that's Saturday, that's Sunday, and then we have a film, film festival later on, I think the 10th, 11th, and 12th, which we can talk about later. Those are all the things going on in Princeton. There are more things going on in Philadelphia. Rutgers just sent us all the things that they're doing. So if you want to hang out and do things around Robeson people and Robeson folks, there's going to be lots of opportunities. And if you have any questions, you can certainly come back, ask me, ask Dr. Dr. J. Roz Anderson Flood. She's a member of our board. Ben Colbert, the president of the board. Kevin Gift is here. He's on our board. Any of us can answer questions about all Martha Sword, all the things that are planned. Oh, one more thing. In addition to the poem that's been commissioned, we've commissioned a quilt. The Sinoka, the Prince and Sinoka quilt makers are designing an original quilt um, to commemorate the 125th birthday. And I'll just say we're celebrating in 2023. We're also going to be celebrating in 2024. So we've got another year after this to continue to celebrate and get the get the word out about who Paul Robeson was and what he stands for and um and why we think so that he should be celebrated and known and integrated into. K-12 education and, and in all the, uh, the instances where one would like to see uh, someone who's been really excellent, really excellent American. Dr. Jory, did I cover everything or did I miss something? No, I think that's it. It's really exciting because we'll get an opportunity to um, share more in small groups. So thank you, thank you very much. We should, oops. So thank you so much. That was a really powerful talk, Thomas. And thank you, Denise, for uh, it's so exciting to hear all the amazing things happening at the Paul Robeson Center. So we are now going to be inviting you into breakout rooms. In your breakout rooms, please identify one person who will be taking notes so that when we come back as a larger group, we can share some memorable points from our discussion with each other. There are several community agreements that um, we would like everyone to consider, listen to each other respectfully so that each person has an opportunity to be heard, take space, make space. People are encouraged to overcome the reluctance to talk, take care not to dominate the conversation, allow everyone to have equal airtime, be careful not to interrupt when someone is speaking. Please agree to respect one another's privacy by keeping this discussion and people's names and identities confidential. We ask that you embrace the concept, whatever is said or shared in this room stays in this room. 
please speak from your own personal experience to avoid making generalizations. White people may feel uncomfortable when a person of color shares a hard truth. They should also understand that sharing these truths can be painful or even traumatic for the person of color. And while we commit to centering these conversations through the lens of race, participants may experience these conversations through a variety of lenses. We acknowledge intersectionality, the interconnected nature of social categorizations such as race, class, and gender, regarded as creating overlapping and interdependent systems of discrimination or disadvantage. We make space for the breadth of human experience and all are welcome. So these are the questions identified for today. Why does otherness remain a constant boundary between people of different faiths, ethnicities, socioeconomic class, or status? Which habits do I personally have that reinforce otherness with people unlike me? And how can I open my awareness to the illusion and see beyond it? So look forward to seeing you in a few minutes. Do we have any questions? Sure, I'm happy to go with our group. Um, sorry, I'm just gonna try not to read my notes directly, but um, one participant um, was quite moved by tonight's conversation when she realized that growing up, her family had a, a lot of knowledge and, and interaction with people who were different um, and different looking and different heritage. And she never sort of realized at the time how valuable that was and how important it was. And um, was, was quite um, taken aback today by by sort of recognizing that. Um, we um, had a couple of books that were cited. One is The Politics of Trauma by, uh, I think it's Stacey Haynes, um, unre about unresolved um, shame from trauma or other effects and how that shapes us. Um, the idea of persistence that, um, that, you, that both Einstein and Paul Robeson failed repeatedly and kept at it and um, that sort of led to the conversation about um, otherness and why do people stay other and separate is because it's hard work because um, you have to um, step up and, and um, throw yourself throw yourself out there and possibly be rejected and um, not easy to do but um, that the work has to be done and clearly the people here tonight want to do it um, um, and I guess we talked about habits and that we have to work to manage our discomfort, uh, know how to listen or learn to listen more, um, and how to embrace, embrace others. Oh, that question, um, um, blah, 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 what? well, it's sort of going back on itself. It's tr just more about trying to understand others and, and listening and not being afraid to try and um, seek out others, not sit back and wait for them to come to you, but seek them out through anything, your interactions, your daily interactions and Facebook and political leanings and whatever, and to try and see both sides of every story. I think that sort of covered most of us. Excellent job, Martha. Thanks for sharing all these different themes. Any other volunteers wanna share what they spoke about in their group? Uh, Hi. Um, well, one of the things that we talked about was, first of all, there were some new people who had never, you know, been to one of these conversations before. And, um, you know, the, the subject matter itself um, was very interesting to people to, you know, bring them to the group tonight. And, uh, you know, there was a little bit of a discussion about um, America being... Um, a melting pot and whether or not, you know, people hanging on to their own ethnic or national or religious um, identities versus, you know, think really truly being American and seeing everyone as American, how that just the whole way that our, our country evolves, um, just how that relates to otherness. Um, and someone was bringing up that a lot of uh, otherness can stem from having a mindset where there's not enough for everybody. And so it separates people because they feel like if they're gonna, if they have to give up something to, um, in order for someone else to get something as opposed to a mindset that there's really enough for everybody. And um, that that would help bring people together 
and I think the last thing that we talked about was, you know, really, you know, putting yourself, each of us putting ourselves in situations where we're actually becoming friends and interacting with people who are um, a little bit different from us and how that one-on-one -on -one, um, interaction really um, moves forward the ideas of togetherness and not otherness. That's all. Thank you very much, Molly. And yeah, I agree that scarcity mindset really creates otherness. Um, Anyone else want to volunteer? We had a rich uh, discussion in our group um, and it was exciting to hear so many personal stories that included internalized other, othering that happens and the hierarchical and tyrannical structure of othering that happens, that keeps you from really moving beyond boundaries that are set by the illusions. Um, we stuck with um, the theme that TJ presented around the illusions, rejection, otherness, and fear. And it, it presented in a couple of different ways in the questions, the idea of fear coming from a lack of familiarity and not knowing, which leads to um, things as complicated as imposter syndrome, which is another way of othering yourself. Um, it was interesting to also think about Paul Robeson in this context and the Robeson family. Um, our historian, Shirley Satterfield was in our group and she beautifully told the story of othering within the Robeson family and about uh, the rebel among the Robesons who was Paul's older brother, Reed, who was actually um, pushed out for his less than Presbyterian ways of dealing with racism at that point. Uh, and I think it was really wonderful to have members of our group share their stories and what it was like to uh, process over the course of their lifetime and how accepting uh, that whiteness or one's own whiteness was perhaps um, a way to be accepted and or is the antithesis of so much that was presented today. And so that was nice. Thank you so much. It sounds like a very rich discussion. And um, anyone else want to volunteer? It took a little bit of notes from our group. Um, so again, we talked about otherness coming out of fear. And um, Joyce, I don't know if you wanna share the story about the mathematical sign. Okay. Yeah, I will. So um, recently I was watching um, the game show, Jeopardy. And it was the final question. And it was, there was a mathematical sign that is also associated with marginalized groups of people. Raise your hand if you think you know what it is. TJ. Less than. You got it. <laughs> I was mortified. I couldn't believe they actually said this. Less than, less than whiteness. I wish they could have just figured, went ahead and figured it out. Yeah, less than whiteness. So that is where we are today. And this was recent. This was, I think, last week. Because um, sometimes I, I do I do silly things like watch Jeopardy. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you, yeah. And um, we talked about how textbooks don't talk about the accomplishments of other people who aren't white and the lack of humanity that white people have put onto black folks. Um, we talked about Isabel Wilkerson's book, Cast, and how insidious our caste system is institutionalizing otherness. And um, we talked about Paul Robeson's father and how he insisted his kids get out there and fight and be courageous. 
And one of our members was from the South and he fought in the civil rights movement. He said, we knew we were doing the right thing. We were not going to go through another decade of white racists. And that being courageous is so essential in breaking through this illusion of otherness. So very grateful to you all. Very grateful to you, um, TJ, for your excellent presentation. Very grateful to you, Denise, for all the outstanding work you're doing at the Paul Robeson Center. I'm very grateful to you, Dr. Barnes Johnson, for helping arrange this CC. And we have a very exciting CC coming up next month on May 1st at 7 p.m. Um, it's uh, some Benjamin, sorry, just trying to find the right spot here. Um, Benjamin Salisbury from the Emmett Till Interpretive Center in Sumner, Mississippi, and Not In Our Town board member Joyce Trotman Jordan will be discussing about Emmett Till's legacy um, and comparing and contrasting with the current situation and some ways in which we can respond to racial injustices of today using the resources at our disposal. So looking forward to seeing you all and thank you for spending your evening with us tonight. Thank you, Connie. Thank you, TJ. I thought your presentation was wonderful. Thank you. Thank you so much, Ben. I appreciate that. It's very kind. Thank you all so much. Have a lovely evening. You too.